my opinion is not relevant here. I'm not going to tell the delegates how they should do their jobs because I am chair of the convention. Using the term radical Islamic extremism is not a counterterrorism strategy. It is a political talking point. Donald Trump's ideas about the economy and the world will cause millions of Americans to lose their jobs. Hillary Clinton has perfected the politics of personal profit and even theft. She's a world-class liar. Freedom is back in style. Welcome to the revolution. We burning down the night, shooting bullets at the moon. Behind-the-scenes information on breaking news and more bold, inspired solutions for America. Stay right here for our final news roundup and information overload. More than 730,000 lives have been changed as a result. These are students, their teachers, their doctors, their lawyers. They're Americans in every way but on paper. And fortunately, today's decision does not affect this policy. It does not affect the existing DREAMers. Two years ago, we announced a similar expanded approach for others who are also low priorities for enforcement. We said that if you've been in America for more than five years with children who are American citizens or legal residents, then you too can come forward, get right with the law, and work in this country temporarily without fear of deportation. Both were the kinds of actions taken by Republican and Democratic presidents over the past half century. Neither granted anybody a free pass. All they did was focus our enforcement resources, which are necessarily limited, on the highest priorities. Convicted criminals, recent border crossers, and threats to our national security. This is an election year, and during election years, politicians tend to use the immigration issue to scare people with words like amnesty in hopes that it will whip up votes. Uh, keep in mind that millions of us, myself included, go back generations in this country with ancestors who put in the painstaking effort to become citizens. And we don't like the notion that anyone might get a free pass to American citizenship. But here's the thing. Millions of people who have come forward and worked to get right with the law under this policy, they've been living here for years, too, in some cases even decades. So leaving the broken system the way it is, that, that's not a solution. In fact, that's the real amnesty, pretending we can deport 11 million people or build a wall without spending tens of billions of dollars of taxpayer money uh, is abetting uh, what is really just factually incorrect. It's it's not going to work. It's not good for this country. It's a fantasy that offers nothing to help the middle class and demeans our tradition of being both a nation of laws and a nation of immigrants. All right, that's the president responding today to the Supreme Court, a 4-4 split on the challenge to the president's immigration executive action, which we've all said from the beginning is illegal and unconstitutional because he's bypassing laws that were passed by previous Congresses and through executive fiat, just rewriting the law as he decides he wants to write it. Now, the decision is not a full opinion, but just a one sentence line that says the judgment is affirmed by an equally divided court. And what that means is the fate of the president's immigration programs hinge on the next election. In other words, this lawsuit started the U.S. versus Texas, and it had been brought by 26 uh, states led by Texas, objecting to the administration's 2014 executive actions that should have could have shielded millions of undocumented workers, or as the president say, says, they're American in every way but on paper. Uh, that would mean they're here illegally, uh, on paper. Anyway, we've got that. We've got the Supreme Court upholding affirmative action in university admissions, and a lot of other court rulings war uh, that we'll get to as well also we have uh the third officer in the freddie gray case acquitted once again how could they be so wrong after so many people had their hopes driven so high that they expected convictions for all of these police officers all right here to weigh in on all of this danielle mclaughlin attorney expert and co-wrote the federalist society how conservatives took the law back from liberals jay seculo is the chief counsel for the american center for law and justice jay let's talk first about how this 4-4 tie ostensibly blocks obama's executive action on immigration 
Well, it does, it, it, at least for now. The decision of the court basically affirms the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit said that the president violated what is called the separation of powers, that he did not have the authority to change the law on his own, that that was an executive overreach. The president, you played the, the sound there where the president says there are Americans in every way but on paper, but that but on paper is really important because if you don't have legal papers to be in the United States of America, guess what? You're not here legally. So that that's one significant aspect. Number two. Two, it does highlight that the next presidential election, because we know there's a vacancy. Look, Sean, if, if, if Justice Scalia uh, had not been deceased, we would have had a 5-4 merits win, and it would have ended the case, period. I, I still think I'd rather be 4-4 tied than the, on the other end losing, but uh, five justices would have made a difference. A fifth justice would have made a difference. So the death of Justice Scalia highlights what is at stake in the next presidential election, at least as it relates to the courts, and that's a big issue. What do you make about the other decisions of today? Well, the, the case involving the admissions requirement, it, people are saying this was a big win for affirmative action, but they need to read the opinion because even in the majority opinion, there is clearly an indication that this kind of preferential treatment needs to be constantly reevaluated and probably brought to an end sooner rather than later. So again, you know, it's splintered courts, here's what you're going to have. But um, I wasn't shocked with this one uh, in the nature of the, the case, but I think it even, even the majority opinion, there is some concern uh, where it ends up. Uh, ultimately on affirmative action. I think affirmative action has, has probably seen its day and, and it may be a case or two away because generally they've been gutted uh, pretty successfully um, over the last couple of years. So this breathed a little bit of life into it, but I don't think life so long. Let me say one other thing, Sean, this immigration thing, though, which is big. The president kept threatening to use uh, his phone and his pen. And I think what even this 4-4 split did was show that his pen's out of ink and his phone ran out of battery because he's not going to be able to, between now and the end of his term, he can't do this again. Let me bring Danielle in here. Danielle, on these two big issues, uh, on the 4-4 tie and the affirmative action case being upheld and admissions, your thoughts? You know, I'm actually largely in agreement with Jay on his analysis. Uh, certainly, so first we go to the DAPA case, which is the immigration case. You know, the upholding of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals really did say that the administration didn't follow what it was required to do administratively, and part of that was a notice and comment period uh, when ordinary people were meant to be able to come and put their thoughts forth about what this executive Well, I th- actually, I actually read it a little differently. I mean, what, I think it's very clear that this was about, if you go to the earlier court decision, this was about separation of powers and co-equal branches of government, and the president doesn't unilaterally have a constitutional right or a legal right to rewrite laws on his own. No, absolutely. I don't disagree. And actually, the, sort of the second part of that was that uh, the court had said that the INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, and the, act, the statutory basis for that you know, for that agency that overrides the president's power here. So, and I think Obama admitted it himself. He has reached the the limits of his power. The court has basically yep. said that. So it's back to the drawing board, and it's back to Congress to find a solution to immigration. Well, I think that's all true. What are your What are your thoughts on the affirmative action case? I again, I agree with Jay. I think this was a very closely circumscribed case. I thought it was interesting that Justice Kennedy, as you well know, a swing voter, uh, sided with uh, affirmative action this time, whereas normally. Normally, he has voted against it. Um, this ongoing obligation for the University of Texas to show by data that their race-conscious admissions process is actually doing what it is designed to do is very important and is required by this, uh, this opinion and by, for any other institution of higher learning. But I tend to agree with Jay. I think that this is a smaller victory than perhaps if, uh, advocates it- of... Yeah, affirmative action would have liked. But. If if discrimination is wrong, and I think we all agree with that, is is another kind of discrimination as a remedy? Is that equally wrong? Well, this is the eternal question, and John Roberts famously said the way to stop discriminating on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. And, Jay, right. I'd be interested in your thoughts, but, you know, the sort of the liberal view yeah. is that African Americans, Hispanics, basically non-whites, have had a long history of discrimination in this country, and that we still are required to have some kind of consciousness in terms of righting those historic wrongs. You know, part of it is this kind of this enabling, I think, of the vestiges of Jim Crow. I mean, this is, but except it's a long time ago. And if you talk to a lot of 
academics, uh, African-American academics, they're saying that these young men and women that are coming out of high school or college or going into the professions that are minorities compete very well with their non-minority counterpart. So the the point is, I think what John Roberts, what Danielle said was right, John Roberts was right. You know, the way to end discrimination based on race is to stop discriminating based on race. So I think it needs to be more of an equal playing field now. I think that's where this should go. I think it was going in that direction. Danielle's also, I think, right. I mean, it was surprising in a sense that Justice Kennedy uh, went the way he did here, although this case had the opinion itself, the majority opinion has a lot of caveats. All right, let me go. Another case that came down today, the Supreme Court placed new limits on state laws that make it a crime for motorists sus- suspected of drunken driving or DUI to refuse alcohol tests. The justices ruled that police must obtain a search warrant before requiring drivers, <laughs> excuse me, drivers to take blood and alcohol tests, yeah. uh, but not breath tests, which the court considers less intrusive. And this came in response to three cases in which drivers actually challenged the so-called implied consent laws in Minnesota and North Dakota as violating the constitutional ban on unreasonable search and seizure. What's your take on it? Uh, can I say one thing real quick on that, Sean? The, the, the Sotomayor Kagan opinions in that case said that they don't even think that a breath test they think for a breath test, you'd have to have a search warrant, a warrant to do the test. Well, the I think that's, is, that's the, absurd. By the, by the time you get <laughs> – look, I actually came – this is a true story. One day – so we were doing Man on the Street in a nightclub when we did Hannity's America years ago in New York. Now, the nightclub doesn't get going until like 12 o'clock. I mean, right. these night owls live very different lives than I do, obviously. Anyway, so I waited for the place to get busy, and I actually did buy drinks for my... I did not have a single drop of alcohol. I knew I was driving home. I had driven myself there. Anyway, I walk out of the club at like 1 in the morning after we got the filming done. I get in my car, and I drove... I make a right turn I on a green light. Now, at this particular location in New York, it's lit up like a summer day. There's so many people on the street. Cop says, get out of the car. And you got to blow into this. I'm like, I didn't have a single drink. I promise you, not one drink. And he made me blow. It blows zero, zero. And it, then he goes, no, this can't be right. Blow again. Zero, zero. And, you know, I had to call my boss and say, well, there might be a picture of me in the paper tomorrow getting a breathalyzer test because the cop was being obnoxious. Right. And the only evidence that they would have had that I had any alcohol was I came out of a club at one in the morning. And I guess it's a fair assumption that somebody would have had a drink, but I didn't have one. Yeah. I, I mean, this... This case was all about the the tension between your privacy rights and then you know the laws of the road that keep us all safe. And basically, what the court came out and said was the impact of breath testing on your your privacy is slight, but the need for breath testing is high because of the you know enormous number of death and injury that results from uh, drunk driving. Yeah, Jay. Yeah, I think. Look, I mean, there's, there's the expectation of privacy is always the legal issue when you when you get to the the invasion of privacy or whether there's an ability to get a warrant or do you need a warrant? It's the old stop and frisk. Well, but Remember the thing those. is, let's say somebody's close. Yeah. Let's say the average state law is is point oh eight in terms of the legal limit of alcohol you can have in yeah. your blood and your your breath. And you know, let's say you're one point oh, so you're above the legal limit. By the time yep. they get a search warrant and you sober up That's and the problem. and eat like right. a you know eat and absorb the alcohol alcohol in your system and drink right. a lot of water, I mean... And so go they the- can be manipulated. And then that's why majority has to... You know, I think that the, the breath test is is the easier case. And yeah. that's been the law, by the way, for a long time. The, the blood tests have always been deemed to be more intrusive, though. Any t- and, and by the way, not just in this context, any t- blood withdrawal, blood for medical purposes. You remember all those cases. Right, so the this has always has, been a different issue. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the government then has a blood sample of yours. Um, and then the question is, what do they do with that? Actually, to your point... Sean, about this notion of warrantless searches. Actually, on Monday, there was another case where the court ruled that if you have an outstanding warrant for basically anything um, and you are the victim of an unconstitutional search and seizure, if it was conducted in good faith, then the fruits of that search and seizure can actually be admitted against you because of the fact of that outstanding warrant. Yeah. All right. Let's go to Baltimore. And it looks like uh, the Baltimore prosecutor, Marilyn Mosby, is now... Strike three. You know, strike three in her so-called quest for justice. We all witnessed in horror what happened in Baltimore. The thing that frustrates me is the continuous rush to judgment. We saw it in Ferguson. Uh, Even the president weighed in on that case. Mr. Constitutional Attorney himself, without hearing from the eyewitnesses who corroborated 
Officer Darren Wilson's story that he was being charged at repeatedly and threatened. And this guy, you know, Michael Brown yeah. fought for his gun and he was not indicted in that case or jumping into the case. President jumped into the Trayvon Martin case and my son would look like Trayvon. And he didn't uh, account for an eyewitness that actually identified Trayvon Martin on top of George Zimmerman, grounding and pounding his head into cement, just like the Cambridge police. Well, this is the third time this prosecutor has tried to get a conviction and she's zero for three and at some point you got to say okay there was not a crime committed here and i think at the end of the day that's what the juries are saying right and this was i read the opinion today this was a a judge who is acquitted as you say the other uh, defendants this was the most serious number of crimes this was nine charges against this police officer including second degree depraved heart murder but based on the officer's testimony um the judge determined that there was no criminal conduct here well, there, the, the, I think at some point we've got to examine, you know, whether, you know, the so-called Ferguson effect, the Baltimore effect, cops can't do their jobs because that's the problem. You know, now they're now they're scared to death to do their jobs for fear they're going to get indicted. But I got to roll. Thank you both for being with us.